and then of course Eastern religions. But before you can talk about that, you have to talk about the Eastern culture, their temperament, and how out of that temperament or psychology a certain tradition is formed. And then that's it. Okay. And we can talk about masturbation and um, <laughs> being, a burden. being a burden, of course, yes. Okay. I'll try to connect all these questions together. Uh, we'll save Eastern religions for last because it'll be difficult to connect them to. Yeah. Let me begin by telling you a story about being a burden, about passion, about love hate, and about certain physical pleasures and technology. About 30 years ago, I was driving from Roseville to San Francisco to get my master's in philosophy. And I was going to the admissions office. It was upstairs on the second floor. So as I'm climbing the stairs, I look down and there is this young, attractive woman. And she looks like my kind, my people. She looked Middle Eastern. I said, man, there is something about her. I don't know what it is. I just like her. And that's one of the things about inspiration, you know? You just have no idea where it comes from, how it happens, why it happens. It's like it comes down and it enters into you and it, grows bigger and bigger and bigger until it becomes this passion from which you can't walk away. So instead of going to the admissions and records office, I go downstairs and I look at it and say, hi, are you Persian? And she says, yes, I am. And then of course it's her turn to get something done and I wait and I wait and I wait and she doesn't show up. And then I say, well, screw this. I have to go back and do my own stuff. And then for the next few months, I just keep looking for her. Someone you met and you saw for no more than a minute and for some strange reason, you stalk her, you pursue her, you want to harass her, <laughs> but nowhere to be found. So a year or so passed by and I'm doing my uh, final exam to get my degree and I hear this voice and it sounds familiar and she's speaking to an instructor. I put my head through the door crack and it's here a year or so later. And now I have to make a choice. Do I want to wait until she is done so I can have a chat with her? Or do I want to go and get my master's degree? And I say to myself, why don't I tell the committee that I got into an accident? I'm talking about a time where there were no cell phones, right? So I just wait and wait and wait for this woman to be done. 
<laughs> we're just talking and talking and talking endlessly. So I wait for about 45 minutes, and then she gets done. And then like a nice politician, a con artist, as she's walking out, I bump into her. Oh, hi. Do you remember me? Oh, yes, I remember you. Well, what are you doing right now? Now, remember, I have to go to my meeting to get my master's degree in philosophy. But you see, passion is passion and reason. The most rational thing to do is go before your committee. They're going to ask you some questions. You're going to respond to them in a relatively intelligent way. And they're going to say, Amir Sabzavari, congratulations, here's your diploma. Versus passion. These intense feelings and emotions running in your veins. And you can't control them, you know. And then there comes a point where you say, I'm going to put my reason on the cross and crucify it. And I'm going to follow my passion. So... Her and I walked out, and we talked for about half hour, 45 minutes, cunningly. I asked for her phone number. You know, you have to put people in the proper situation, like a checkmate them, and then they have no choice but to say, well, here's my number, you know? And so I get her number, and uh, I run to the office where I'm supposed to be interviewed for my diploma and the committee is gone. But I didn't really much care. I never liked school. I still don't. So how did this passion be created? You look at something. And all of a sudden, you find yourself in a certain mood. And we'll talk about moods, feelings, emotions, and psychology a little bit later. But for today, you look at something, you have a certain feeling, and then you have an option. Well, you don't really have an option. The feeling is either intense enough that it'll just guide you, or you have too much fear and you say, no, I have to go to this place or that place, so maybe I'll come back and she'll still be there. So before you can have a passion for anything, you have to have this thing called attraction. Even though we've written this stuff down plenty of times, I'll do it since most of you in this class are high. Yeah. <clears throat> so it begins with attraction. If you're not attracted to something, passion is never going to be created. Interest is never going to be created. But attraction by itself is not enough. Because the moment you're attracted to anything, you need to have a very fertile imagination. You need to have a relatively good amount of blank or empty space inside your brain. Not too many things out there have the power to distract you. So you just only focus on a, the thing that attracted you. As you play with the images inside your head, <clears throat> something really interesting happens. Attraction leads you to curiosity. It's not yet passion, curiosity. You begin to ask yourself, why is her hair so silky? Why does she look so good? Why am I attracted to her? I'm old enough to be her great, great, great grandfather. Not really, but still. You begin to ask all these questions inside your head, you see. And you know what happens when you keep asking questions? This blossoms into this. And then you go to Google and you type her name to see if you can get any information, figure out where she leave, leaves or lives so you can drive to her house late at night, and peek through the window. 
you know, like one of those horror shows. And why are you doing this? Because you have played with the images inside your head so much that curiosity now leads to interest. Who is she? What is she? How old is she? What is she studying? What does she do? What's her history? And then, of course, at a certain point, you give her a call and you say, hey, I've been looking for you. <laughs> and then you go out. And all the questions you had at the stage of curiosity, all the questions you had at the stage of attraction, all the questions you had at the stage of interest, now at a coffee shop, or in my case, I took her to Muir Woods. Big, tall trees, dark, nobody is walking. You can't find the soul, it's just her and I. <laughs> the dangerous place. Now, We talk, and the problem with talking, especially if it's founded on attraction, is that you can't by just grow more and more fond of the person you're talking to or talking with. Attraction grows, curiosity grows, interest grows, and one morning you wake up and you say, Ah, I couldn't sleep last night. I was thinking about this woman. And you want to focus on your philosophy exam, but you can't because you're thinking about this woman. Who's Plato? It's this woman. What do you want to eat? This woman. Where do you want to go? Wherever she is. And all of a sudden you realize your interest has blossomed into this thing called obsession. Oh man. Obsession is passion from the Latin Pasco, meaning to suffer. So any of you ever find yourself in a place of attraction, my recommendation is do not nourish it. Do not feed it. Let it starve and die. Assalamu alaikum. Should you nourish this and lead it to curiosity? Should you nourish this and have it go to interest? Should you nourish this? All of a sudden, you find yourself in a place of obsession. <clears throat> your suffering is going to begin. You're going to have this burden on your shoulder. Now, you see, you have a good amount of power when you're at this stage. You can walk away. You can distract yourself with other things. You can be curious about her or anything. But there are lots of things to be curious about throughout the day. You can be interested and a thousand and one different things under the sun. You still have power. You have choice. <clears throat> you have what we call free will, wrongly put. But when you get to a place of obsession, what you really do sometimes is you wake up and you say, <clears throat> I don't want to think about her, and yet I do. I want to focus on my classes, but I can't. I want to have a good night's sleep, but she won't let me. Not because she's laying next to you, she's in your head. And the more you fight this, the bigger obsession gets, and then something awful happens. You get to a place called infatuation. Can you read my handwriting? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you do your signature? 
Infatu <laughs> infatuation. Now, infatuation is passion times a thousand. There is no escape from this prison. There are moments you wake up in bed and you say, I want to die. But death doesn't come your way. It's not because God loves you. It's because Satan just loves you too much. Wants you to suffer some more. When you are in the cradle of infatuation, your circle just shrinks. You got no mom. You got no dad. You got no friends. There is no place you can go to get some rest, some calm, some comfort. <clears throat> this woman or this man become your only oasis. There is nowhere else to go. You want to go to this person and say, I really, really like you, but you can't just yet. You have no idea how he or she is going to react. Maybe like, they look at you and say, I love you too, but only as a brother. <laughs> now, now, here's the thing you need to know about obsession and infatuation. The other person occupies so much space inside you that you have lost yourself completely. You have no idea where to go to find the Amir Sabzavari. You say, I used to be a philosopher, but now I'm madly in love with this person. I used to be an A student, and now I really don't care about school. I used to be this, and I used to be that, but the only thing I think about now is this woman or this man. If you had any power in these stages, the moment you get to obsession and infatuation, you have zero power. The other person has power over you. And then, of course, time passes, and then you find yourself in a really, really, really awful place. Talk about burden. Talk about being a Jesus Christ carrying this cross called love on your shoulder. You call her, she doesn't pick up. And you say, she's probably talking to other men. You text her and she just like replies with one of those tiny little faces. So what the hell is this? I wrote her a novel and she gives me a, like a face. You go to bed at 11, you can't sleep, you toss, you turn. You say, God damn it, I have work tomorrow. I have to go to class tomorrow. You wake up at six. You try, man. You try to go to sleep. This won't happen. You're in love. And you say, well, how can I get myself exhausted? So out of exhaustion, I can just pass out and get two hours of sleep. You masturbate. But it won't work. It won't work. It won't work for one simple reason. You feel as if you're committing a crime against yourself. Love has baptized you. Love has made you noble. The only person you want to be passionate with is this person. Not yourself. Not anyone else. And just in case you are passionate or intimate with another... Man, guilt and shame and remorse and regret and repentance will be following you. All of them. 
It's as if fun has disappeared from your entire life. All you want is this person. So for those of you who want to live a relatively carefree life, be attracted, <clears throat> but not curious. Be curious, but not interested. Be interested, but don't obsess. Because the moment you obsess, you have no choice but to be carrying something on your shoulders that you hardly know. And it robs you of yourself. Allahu <clears throat> Akbar. Yes. Sorry? Oh, you can't. I told you, you can't. The moment you're in... Allahu Akbar! The moment you're infatuated, it's finished. Go to Costco, buy yourself a coffin, you're dead. There is nothing you can do. Allahu Akbar! There is nothing you can do. You have power up to this point. You can sabotage how you feel. But you need to have a Herculean will that every time you think about this person, somehow you just push it away. You play video games. You go out with your friends. You get high. You get drunk. Like some of my friends... You go on the lake and you just run until you pass out. You go to the gym and hit the punching bag for 15 hours. So when you go home, your companion is pain and exhaustion, not the object of obsession. There's a good chance you won't be successful. Because the moment you have obsession, something really amazing happens to you. Look at you. Look at all of you. Look at me, pathetic, <laughs> disgusting. <sighs> Our life is like Groundhog Day. Have you seen the movie? The day repeats itself over and over and over again until you and I just die. And it doesn't even end there. You know what happens when I die? First, if I'm lucky, my wife will cry. Then after a while, she'll just talk about me, how much she misses me. Time passes, she'll just think about me. Time passes, she says, you know, those frames I have on the TV or on the dash or whatever, they're taking too much space. I love Amir, but I need to clean my house. First, the frames are removed. And then there are no tears about Amir Sabzavari. Then the frames are gone. Then instead of thinking about Amir every day, it becomes every other day, then every week, then once a month. And then once in a blue moon. Once I die, I'll eventually be forgotten. Consider that for a moment. Nobody will ever care. You're far too young to understand. You know, people like Ray and I, we have struggled for 50, 60, 70 years to do something with our lives. We haven't done much, but we hope that it counts for something. And then you die. And then when you examine things, you realize, man, the earth has been around for a few billion years. People have been around for a couple million years. And in the end, everybody gets forgotten. Do you remember your great, great grandparents? No, it's as if they never existed. That you haven't really done anything in your life, with your life, to ever be remembered. You're not significant. You're not relevant. That's a horrifying thing to say and think. Now, <clears throat> a 
For those of you who play a good amount of video games, for those of you who by nature are very solitary, for those of you who have been traumatized by life, by people in your life, You still have a good amount of space inside you that has remained uncontaminated that will allow you to find yourself attracted, attracted to other things. You have this possibility to find things attractive out there. You also have the ability to make attraction into an object of curiosity and then interest. But because of your dicey past, because of all the brokenness that lives inside you, your obsession, though you love, though you care, there is a good amount of loneliness inside you. It's always been there because of the trauma. The loneliness is always there. And you control it by making sure no one will ever have power over you. You're always in charge of your life, your emotions, your intellect, your desires. But when someone enters inside you and now has power over you, controls the way you think and feel, that you lose the power to think on your own, feel on your own. You wake up and you have them in your mind. Your loneliness comes with a good amount of anger. It's not just obsession. You become possessive. You become compulsive. And you treat other people like slaves. You own them. Now, you don't have to have a traumatic past for all this to happen. You're born... The rent is too high, food is too expensive, your father is at work, and your mom has no choice but to get a job as well. They come home exhausted and there you are. They can't spend too much time with you, so what do you do? You sit by the TV or you play video games. You learn how to be alone. It's not a healthy aloneness. But you learn how to be alone. For those of you who know this man named Charles Darwin, it doesn't matter what your environment is. It doesn't matter how your life has been. It doesn't matter your history. There is wisdom inside all of us. You will learn how to survive. It doesn't mean you survive healthily. But you will survive. I'm from Iran. In the 1970s and 80s, a lot of political prisoners were freed. And they migrated to America. And Iran used to have a very vicious government. They still do. It's more vicious than before. And what they did to political prisoners was that they tortured them. In the most horrifying of ways, those who survived, you know, some of my friends would ask, so how did you survive being tortured on a daily basis? I would lose myself in imagination, imagine as if I don't have a body. We are creatures that will do whatever we possibly can to continue our survival, our existence regardless of how much suffering and pain that may be imposed upon us. By the time you're 10, you've sat in your room and played video games for five, six, seven hours, you have zero social abilities. You're not a social human being. And remember to create a relationship with other human beings, you need to talk, you need to laugh, you need to be decent, you need to be nice, but you've lost all of that. You want to have a relationship with them, but you can't. Add to it the fact that pornography is the biggest and the most powerful money-making machine in America. 
Not so much Europe because they have a different relationship with human body and sex. America is different. Over the past 20 years of teaching at Laney, I've had so many young men coming to my office telling me that they're addicted to sex or pornography. But they're no longer 15 or 16 or 17, you know. They're like 25. They want to go out there. They want a companion. They want someone to talk to. They want to lay with someone. They want to have food with someone. But they don't know how to be with another human being in an intimate way. And this is like any other addiction. Is technology good? Absolutely. Not when you're three and you become obsessed with video games. 